ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير واشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح الامه وكشف الله به الغمه فصلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يقول الله تعالى بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we glorify him, we seek his help and his assistance, uh, we seek his forgiveness and his pardon, and we praise him for allowing us to reach another blessed day of Jum'ah, as we praise him as well for allowing us to have completed the blessed month of Ramadan, uh, which was completed a few weeks ago, alhamdulillah. And we send our peace and blessings on the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions and his family and all those who follow them until the last day. There is a hadith uh, narrated by Imam Muslim in his Sahih on the authority of a companion by the name of Hanzala. Hanzala. And this companion, he was a scribe. He was a scribe of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi He used to write down the revelation. And he met Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu one day. He met Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr asked him, how are you? How are you doing? How is everything? And his response was a bit shocking. He had a shocking response. And this surprised Abu Bakr. Alhamdulillah, he said, when Abu Bakr asked him, how are you? He said, nafaqa Alhamdulillah. That Alhamdulillah has become a hypocrite. That Alhamdulillah has become a hypocrite. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was surprised to hear an answer like this. He said, subhanallah, how could you say something like this? What are you saying? Alhamdulillah has become a hypocrite. And we know that the hypocrites are in the lowest depths of the fire. That the, the hypocrites, they're in the lowest depths of the fire. So how can any Muslim accuse himself, them, oh, their own self, of being a hypocrite? So, alhamdulillah, he answered, he said that when uh, we, were, we are in the company of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and he reminds us of the paradise and the hellfire, it is as if we are seeing it with our own eyes. So he's reminiscing about the times when he is with the Messenger وسلم, he's with other companions, and his Iman is all the way up. And they are, their, their behavior or their acting as though they can see the, the, the paradise and they can see the hellfire. And then he says that this is the state we are in when we are with the Messenger وسلم. But then when we go back to our families, and we go back to our children, and we go back to our jobs and our careers, then he notices a, no, a difference. He notices a big difference. He says that, and uh, when we attend to our wives, our children, our business, most of these things, they slip out of our minds, rem reminding, re re remembering the hellfire, remembering paradise, the, uh, the, the openness to doing good deeds. These things start to fade when we go with our, uh, to our children and our wives and our families and our jobs. So because of this difference that he feels between when he is with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when he is not with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he felt that this is hypocrisy. He, feel, he felt that this is him being a hypocrite. And so this is why he made that statement. 
So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu responds and he said to him that, uh, and Abu, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he swears and he says that, by Allah, we all feel the same way. You're not alone in this. This is how we all feel. Abu Bakr said, by Allah, we experience the same thing. And this is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu speaking. This is the greatest companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the greatest man after the prophets and the messengers. And he is confirming what Hamdullah is feeling within his own self, which is that we feel the same way when we are with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa when we are in the masjid, when we are with the believers, our iman is sky high. And then when we go back to our families and we go back to our regular lives, then the iman goes a bit down and we start to slip and fo lose focus of those things that we were focusing on when we were in the company of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Bakr says that I feel the same way, we feel the same way. And he used the plural, he said we, meaning it's not just him, but all of the companions, they feel the same way. So they went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to inform him of how they are feeling, this feeling that they're getting. And they went, both Abu Bakr and Hamdullah, and Hamdullah, he made the same statement. He said, oh Messenger of Allah, uh, I've become a hypocrite. I've become a hypocrite. And Rasulullah asked him, what makes you say something like this? And Alhamdulillah gave the same explanation. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when we are in your company and are reminded of hellfire and Jannah, we feel it as if we are seeing it with our own eyes. But then when we go and we, uh, we leave your company, we leave your presence and we attend to our wives and our children and our jobs, then these things go out of our mind. And so this is why he is feeling a type of hypocrisy. So Rasulullah how did he answer him? Rasulullah said to him that by him in whose hand is my life, Rasulullah swore, he said by him in whose hand is my life, if your state, this state that you feel when you are in my presence, this state of high iman, if you feel this state, this state continues and remains that same level all the time, then, and you continue to remain in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, and you have that sky high iman all the time, then the angels will come down and they will shake your hands. The angels, they will come down and they will shake your hands in your beds and on the roads. In other words, you will become like an angel because this is actually the state of the angels. That the, the angels, they remain in that high state all the time. They're always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. wa nahar la yafturun. They are constantly making tasbih of Allah, remembrance of Allah, all the time they don't get tired. This is the angels. But the human beings are different. The human beings are different. So he said that if you are in this state and you maintain this state all the time, then the angels will come and they're going to shake your hands. And then he said to Hamdullah, but time should be devoted to this and time to be, should be devoted to that. Sa'a wa sa'a. Walakin sa'a bi sa'a. He said this three times. And so Rasulullah Sallam confirmed that Hamdul is not a hypocrite, and Abu Bakr is not a hypocrite, and anybody who feels this feeling, this is not hypocrisy, this is natural. And a lot of us, after having coming out of the month of Ramadan, we might be something, feeling something similar to what Hamdullah felt. In the month of Ramadan, our Iman was sky high, and we were doing a lot of extra ibadat, and we were connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, connecting with the Quran. And after Ramadan, there is, of course, a noticeable difference. There is a drop-off, all right? There is a drop-off. And so many of us, we might have that feeling of, am I being a hypocrite that I did all this in Ramadan and now I'm not able to replicate that outside of Ramadan? But the answer is that this is not, hypocr this is not hypocrisy. And this is something natural. And we are not expected to maintain the level that we had in Ramadan outside of Ramadan. This is not something that we're expected to do. And even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he would strive in Ramadan more than he would strive in the other months. And in particular, in the last 10 nights, he would strive in the last 10 nights like he would not strive in any other nights. So even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his he took it up a notch in Ramadan, he took it up an even higher notch in the last part of Ramadan. And of course, when Outside of Ramadan, it's not that he dropped off completely, but he was at a higher level in Ramadan. So even Rasulullah took it up a higher level. So we are not expected to maintain the same level uh, in Ramadan outside of Ramadan. And if you have this expectation, 
then this is what makes a person feel that they have completely failed. But this is not the case. It's not even recommended to fast every single day. This is something not, uh, not even allowed. This is called, uh, or, or it's something not recommended to fast every single day. It's not recommended. Rasulullah says in the hadith that the best fast, the best thing you can do, the best fast thing you can do is the fast, the fast of Dawood every other day. That's the best you can do. So anything more than that, then this is not recommended. So fasting every day is not something we, we even should do outside of Ramadan. We're not expected to make qiyam every single night outside of Ramadan. We're not expected to recite the same amount of Quran that we recited. So we're not expected to maintain those levels that we had in the month of Ramadan. At the same time, if you have a complete free fall, then this is a problem as well. All right, so we have to have a balance. We're not expected to maintain that same level outside of Ramadan that we had inside Ramadan, but we cannot have a free fall where we go from 100 all the way down to zero. This is also a big problem. So we have to maintain that balance. And there's a minimum that every Muslim should have, which is maintaining the obligations. Every Muslim should have that minimum baseline that you maintain the obligations, the salah, praying the five salah, any other, the zakah, any other obligations that uh, come or prohibitions, staying away from prohibitions. This is the minimum. And then after that, every person has their own minimum, which they should look at. And this will be in comparison to how you were before Ramadan. So if before Ramadan, you compare your, your, yourself before Ramadan and after Ramadan, if you have done better, you are a higher level, you have improved from before Ramadan to after Ramadan, then your Ramadan was successful. Even if you don't maintain what you did in Ramadan, as we said, this is not something expected and not something even possible to maintain the, the level we had in Ramadan. But the least you should do is that you should have your situation better after Ramadan than it was before. And if you do that, then your Ramadan has been successful. If your situation is worse, you're worse after Ramadan than it was before Ramadan, then this is a sign that your Ramadan was not successful. This is a sign that maybe your Ramadan was not accepted. And this is a cause for concern. So we should evaluate ourselves and see, is my situation after Ramadan better than it was before Ramadan? If that's the case, then alhamdulillah, your Ramadan was successful. But if, if it's the same or you had a, a, a drop off and you, and you end up worse after Ramadan, then this is a sign that Ramadan was not successful and this is a cause for concern. So everybody should do some type of evaluation uh, of themselves because of that. But as we said, a person is not expected to maintain that level that you had in Ramadan. And this is natural to have a bit of a drop off. It is natural to have a bit of a drop off, but the main thing we must avoid is complete free fall. And this is a major cause for concern if you have a complete free fall. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us what we come, uh, what we, uh, the deeds that we did in the month of Ramadan. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبَعَ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So we mentioned the hadith of Hamdala in which he complained to Abu Bakr and then he complained to Rasulullah that he doesn't feel the same way when he's with his family when he's with, uh, with uh, at his job as he feels when he's in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu and we said that a person after Ramadan might have that same feeling. And this is not hypocrisy, uh, but this is something completely natural. And we are not expected to maintain one state of Iman all the time. We are not expected to maintain that state all the time. We are not expected to maintain the level we had in Ramadan, outside Ramadan. But we should not have a complete drop off. And we should have something remaining from Ramadan to show and prove that we had a successful Ramadan. This hadith has a lot of uh, benefits. Some of the benefits of the hadith is the concept of muhasaba being self-accountable, uh, self calling yourself to account. Alhamdulillah, how did he notice that there was a problem? He was self-reflecting and he's noticing that there's a difference when he's with Rasulullah and when he is not with Rasulullah So he's doing some uh, muhasab of himself, calling himself into account and 
then he realizes that maybe there's a problem and then he goes to the people who can solve that problem or give him the advice and that is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this concept of muhasab is very important and there's a very, very famous statement of Umar radiallahu anhu where he says hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu that call yourself into account before you are called into account and that's referring to the day of judgment yawmul hisab the day when you will be called into account on that day even if you wanted to fix any issues you had, you can't fix it then. If you call yourself into account now, you can fix any mistakes, any shortcomings, you can adjust, and you can fix it now. If you do muhasaba now. But if you wait until yawm al-hisab, then there's no more fixing, there's no more mending, everything is set and fixed and nothing is gonna change. So this concept of muhasab is very important. And we see this from the hadith of Handala. Also, the, the fear of nifaq is something that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, anhum would feel. And these are the best of people, the best of generations, the generation of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But they are feeling that uh, feeling of hypocrisy sometimes. Handala felt it. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said he also felt that same thing. Umar radiallahu anhu, also, he also used to feel that feeling of hypocrisy. There was a companion by the name of Hadifa, Hudayfa ibn, ibn al-Yaman. And he was uh, a companion who was given a secret from the secrets of Rasulullah That was that Rasulullah informed him of the names of the actual hypocrites. So they were actually real hypocrites. And Rasulullah was given that knowledge, this knowledge of the unseen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he told Hudayfa radiallahu an the names of these actual hypocrites. And this was a secret between Rasulullah and Hudayfa. And he did not reveal the secret to anybody. And Umar radiallahu an would ask Hudayfa, am I a hypocrite? And he would want to know from Hudayfa, is he a hypocrite? He would ask this question. And Umar says that we would look at, uh, when a person would die, we would look at a person, uh, we would look at Hudayfa, and we would, say, we, would say, uh, we would see, did Hudayfa pray over him? And if he prayed over him, then we would pray over him. But if Hudayfa did not pray over him, then we would avoid praying over him because Hudayfa knows the names of all the hypocrites. So Umar asked him, am I a hypocrite? Am I on that list? He had fear. He, this is Umar radiallahu anhu. But he had fear of being a hypocrite. And Hudayfa said that, no, you're not on that list. And I'm not going to tell anybody anything else about this list afterwards except for after you. So he closed that book and he didn't want to expose the secret of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But he confirmed to Umar that you're not on that list. But it shows that the level of concern that Umar radiallahu anhu had. And this is something that the Sahaba in general, this is a concern that they had of hypocrisy and falling into hypocrisy. There was a tabi'i who says that, uh, that I, I, I met, I met أكثر من ثلاثين صحابيا I met uh, and I came across over 30 companions. Over 30 companions. كلهم يخاف النفاق على نفسه That every one of them, they f had fear of nifaq. They had fear of hypocrisy. They felt and feared hypocrisy from themselves. So this is something that we shouldn't accuse ourselves of hypocrisy, but this is something that you should always bear in mind and work to controlling and work to mending. Uh, we also see that uh, from this hadith that Iman increases and it decreases as well. Iman increases and it decreases. And increases with ta'a. Al-Iman wa yazidu with ta'a. That obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa yanqusu bil ma'asiyah. And it decreases with disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iman also increases when you put yourself in situations and environments where the Iman can increase. So we notice that, uh, that Hamdallah radiallahu anhu, when, when did his Iman increase? When he was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When he was with the other companions. When they were being reminded about hellfire and paradise. This is when the Iman, iman increased. And the Iman decreased when he was out of that environment. When he, there was no longer any reminders. There's no longer any uh, and anybody there to encourage them to keep that same state. So Iman increases, but there are ways in which we can ensure that Iman increases and maintain that Iman. And that is to put ourselves in the situation, put yourself in the environment where the Iman can increase. And of course we all have lives, we have jobs and we have things to, that we have to, obligations that we have to tend to, but we have to ensure and do our best to put ourselves in environments where the Iman can increase in the masajid, having good company. Good company is very important as well, especially for uh, everyone, but especially for the youth. Having good company is something extremely important, and this can make or break a person. There is a, uh, 
there was an incident that happened in the time of Rasulullah and there's a verse of the Quran about this where Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَيَوْمَ يَعُضُ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَ نِتَّخَدْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا That on the day of judgment, the wrongdoer, he will be biting his hands. He will be biting his hands. وَيَوْمَ يَعُضُ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَ نِتَّخَدْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا And he will be saying, I wish that I took a path with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I took, I wish I took this path. And then he will say afterwards, يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانٍ خَلِيلًا Woe to me, I wish that I did not take so-and-so as a friend. I wish I did not take so-and-so as a friend. And it's mentioned in the tafsir of this verse, that this verse was revealed regarding a man by the name of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id. Uqba ibn Abi, Abi Mu'id. And this person, this individual, was a, from amongst the worst, the worst of enemies of Rasulullah He was the one who took the, the insides of the camel and he threw it, the intestines and the insides of the camel, and he threw it on the back of Rasulullah while he was prostrating. This is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id. And he actually came very close to accepting Islam. In some narrations, it's mentioned that he actually said the shahada when he met with Rasulullah and he said the shahada or he was very close to accepting Islam. But the problem he had was very bad company. He had in his company, his closest friend was uh, Ubay ibn Khalaf. Ubay ibn Khalaf was also one of the main enemies of Rasulullah sallallahu And Ubay ibn Khalaf, he heard that Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id, he's either accepted Islam or he's very close to accepting Islam. And when he met with him, he said, I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to even look at you until you go and you spit in the face of Rasulullah sallallahu Otherwise, our friendship is done. And this person, Uqba, who's so close to accepting Islam, he prioritized his friendship with uh, this person and he went and he spit in the face of Rasulullah and later on he threw the intestines of the camel on Rasulullah and he became one of the worst enemies of Rasulullah and this person Uqba ibn Abi Mu'id he was killed on the day of Badr he was killed on the day of Badr and he died as a disbeliever even having after having coming very close to accepting Islam so we see that the influence of friends, the company you keep, this can have a tremendous impact on uh, an individual. And this can be the cause of you being guided, or this can be the cause of you being misguided and ending up in the fire. As we see in the verse, a person, this wrongdoer will be wish wishing, biting on his hands, wishing, I wish that I did not take that person as a companion. So the importance of good company, the good environment, these are all very important things that we have to uh, look out for, especially the youth. We have a lot of youth in attendance today. Be careful of who you are hanging out with, who are you are associating with. If the person you are associating with is not increasing your iman, then leave them, leave them. And this will be better for you in this life and in the next life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept whatever uh, good deeds that we contributed in the month of Ramadan. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبَ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَنَا مِنْ خَاسِرِينَ لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أنصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أنصر إخواننا المستضعفين في فلسطين اللهم أنصر إخواننا المستضعفين في كل مكان الله we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to grant relief and ease for our brothers and sisters who are continuing to face oppression, continuing to face uh, the, the bombs and the killing and the, the, the torture and whatever else is going on in Palestine and all parts of the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them relief and uh, to compensate them for what they have, have to go through in this life with, with, with what is better in the next life. Allahumma ameen. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمركم بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقيموا الصلاة